I was asked to give this lecture to mark uh, the opening of the new uh, extension of the building which bears my brother's name. Uh, I'm sorry he's not here to hear this and to receive your thanks. But it's a privilege for me to stand in his place. And it seems to me that since the Attenborough building uh, is devoted to the arts, it might be appropriate for me to, to think about something, uh, how the arts uh, affect the natural world. The arts, of course, aren't exclusively concerned with beauty, but many of them are concerned at some time or other with beauty. And beauty, we tend to think, uh, is a prerogative of the human race. It's one of the characteristics by which you can tell whether a being is human. Nobody else appreciates beauty except human beings. Or do they? That is my subject. We see beauty in the natural world. That is the primary source. We see lovely flowers, butterflies, birds. Landscape actually was a rather later acquisition for humanity's appreciation of beauty, certainly in this country. But everybody, the world wide, appreciates beauty in the natural world. We create gardens. During the 19th century, we used to uh, evaluate, value natural history specimens uh, because they were so beautiful, these flowers, these insects, these beetles. Um, and in 1844, a 21-year-old teacher arrived in this city of Leicester. Uh, he was appointed to the Collegiate School, which still existed when I was a boy in Leicester. He was um, a poor man, a self-educated man, uh, and he was earning his career, uh, had been, as an assistant to his brother, who was a trainee uh, surveyor. But this young man uh, had decided that he would teach for a while, so he could get a living. And he was fascinated by the natural history of Leicestershire. And he met a, a young man whose family was concerned with hosiery, the textiles in this city, called Henry Bates. And the young man I'm talking of Alfred Russell Wallace was his name, and Henry Bates roamed the countryside of Leicester, uh, collecting, above all, beetles. And they were astounded to discover that this countryside, which you all know, actually has hundreds of different species of beetle. And one of the great problems for naturalists and natural scientists in the middle of the 19th century was why were there all these immense number of different species of animals and plants? And Wallace and Bates were both fascinated by this. But they were also fascinated by the natural world. And they conceived the idea, these young men with no money, they conceived the idea that maybe they could go to the tropics, to um, South America, the jungles of South America, which were so full of such wonderful things. And perhaps they could collect them and send them back and sell them to people who had loved nature in this world, in, in back here, and get enough money to allow them to go on exploring. Well, so in 1848, they went off to the Amazon. And Wallace uh, stayed there actually for only four years. Bates was going to stay on for much longer. But after four years, Bates had got, uh, Wallace had got a, a great number of specimens, many scientific uh, observations, notes, and he set off to sail back 
to this country. And a few days out of port in South America, the, fish, the ship he was on caught fire and sank. And he was uh, and at sea in, in open boats for many days before eventually he was discovered. He was uh, helped out. But in that time, he lost all, nearly all his work for four years. When he got back, nothing daunted, he decided he would set out again. And this time, he would go to what he called the Malay Archipelago, that's to say Indonesia. And one of his primary things that he really wanted to see were birds of paradise. Birds of paradise seemed to him, as they seemed to me and many others, the absolute pinnacle of natural beauty. And he was the, nobody, though, at that time, no naturalist, no European, had ever seen the display, the fabled dances of the birds of paradise. And Wallace, Alfred Russell Wallace, became the first naturalist to see them. Now, of course, uh, Wallace knew and realized, understood, that birds have different coloration because it's important that males and females of the same species should be able to recognize one another as belonging to the same species and not to some other species. But really, that amount of, of plumes, of, of beautiful feather decorations, was more than was necessary, surely, uh, to uh, simply dis dis to identify a species. Uh, and Wallace concluded that the reason was that the species as a whole, both male and females, had the right constitution, if he would have put it that way, to develop such gorgeous plumes. That there was nothing more significant in them that they were, uh, that the, 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 the blood was red or that fat was yellow. This was just a part of their nature, as he put it. Um, and the reason the females were drab was because they went away to nest. And so they would be very vulnerable if they were nesting out in the open uh, with those gorgeous plumes, because they would be seen by predators. So it was, it was not that they, the females were, um, were um, in any way the genetic result of making um, a, a drab plumage, simply that it was suppressed of their genetic nature. The, the decorations were suppressed. And as proof of that, he argued that there were a number of birds where male and female are both brightly colored, uh, like, for example, bee-eaters, or indeed kingfishers, uh, but those are birds which nest in holes, so it didn't matter that the females were, had not suppressed their colour. Now, that was a very curious argument, you might think, but at any rate, uh, that was what he believed. And it was while he had been the first person to see this display of birds of paradise, and while he was worrying about this. He was also worrying about this other business, about the origin of species. And while he was lying in a malarial fever in a little bit island called Ternate in Indo eastern Indonesia, he suddenly had the idea of natural selection. I won't go into this. Most of you know it in, well enough, but it is perfectly simply the survival of the fittest. That is what led to all the different species, he thought. And he, write, he wrote this as an essay, and he sent it back to one of the more, most distinguished natural scientists in this country at the time, a man by the name of Charles Darwin. And for Darwin, it was a bombshell, because he had had the same idea about natural selection, 15 years earlier, and I had been amassing evidence to prove it before he announced it in public. So this is a, a great bombshell. How could he, what was he to do? Was he to pretend he hadn't thought of this and give the priority to, to Wallace? He talked to his friends and eventually the problem was solved by both of them having papers that were read in the Scientific Society of Linnean, 
in London, and that was that. But, of course, the, uh, the, there nonetheless there were problems about the origin of species, survival of the fittest, and not the least was a problem about birds of paradise, or indeed other birds that had wonderful and beautiful displays, like, for example, the peacock. Darwin eventually came to the conclusion that it was because the female peahen would be impressed by the plumage of the male, and that it was the female that surveyed displaying males like this bird, and eventually would choose, on the basis of the splendor of its tail, uh, the, the, the one that she would mate with. But that, of course, meant that birds had an aesthetic response, that they could actually appreciate beauty. Wallace couldn't accept that. He thought it was impossible. After all, the appreciation of beauty was a characteristic unique to human beings, or so he, saw, or so he thought. Indeed, he actually said um, that he couldn't accept it. And when, uh, but they agreed together, Darwin and Wallace, that for the sake of the theory of evolution by natural selection, they would keep that disagreement quite quiet, and they suppressed it. And it wasn't until many years later that Darwin eventually uh, published this uh, finding of his, this belief of his. And when he did, the, the, the displaying of mail, uh, they, Wallace had to review it, and he wrote, there is a total absence of any evidence that female animals admire or even notice this display. So the disagreement continued for some time. Eventually, Darwin's view uh, was uh, accepted by some, but not all, biologists. Today we know that this disparity between the, pla with the plain drab female and the splendid male like a peacock actually spreads throughout the animal kingdom. And even today we are still discovering all sorts of creatures that we might think of as very lowly creatures, but which nonetheless appreciate beauty. But towards the end of Darwin's life, new discoveries were being made which were an important variation on that principle of drab female and spectacular male. Creatures that didn't modify their bodies, the males didn't modify their bodies to be beautiful, but instead collected inanimate objects, and with those made something to impress females. Now, now we are becoming quite close to the concept of being an artist, because these creatures are birds, they're called bowerbirds, and just towards the end of Darwin's life, he was able to in include a reference in his, one of his last books to these extraordinary creatures, bowerbirds. But there's one further source of beauty uh, that human beings will accept is an appreciation of beauty, and is certainly a question of produ production by art, and that is the art of the dance of choreography. The birds of paradise, the males, for the most part, there are 50 odd different species, for the most part, seek to impress females by gorgeous, extraordinary, almost surrealist feather displays. But one of them, or one group of them, have gone into a different direction. They have adopted a very plain Black display, the males, that is. It's black, they do have a beautiful iridescent bib, it's true, but compared with the greater birds of paradise, which I showed you to start with, these are very plain birds. And they depend on dance 
to impress a female. And one of them is called the Parotia bird of paradise. And he prepares a special dance ground in the forest. When you come across it, you can't believe that it was not man-made. It's an immaculate area, free of twigs or leaves, or in the middle of the thickest bush. So you see animals of all kinds, birds, whales, gibbons, spiders. The males go to enormous lengths to do things which have no practical value. It doesn't produce more food. It doesn't protect the young. It simply pleases the female. And it pleases the females because the females must have an aesthetic sense. Animals, as well as human beings, appreciate the arts.